Hi, my name is Jason Georgie. I'm the field CTO for Prisma Access at Palo Alto Networks. I'm here to talk to you today about the Prisma Access and Okta joint solution around securing a mobile workforce. When we typically have to deal with securing mobile users or mobile users in general, there's always a debate around, you know, can, do, can we get the right type of performance without sacrificing security? Or are we going to have to make some type of sacrifice one way or another? We don't feel that that's necessary today. And it's especially important these days where so many of our users are working from home or you know, just, just basic functionality, right? As far as making sure that we do have the right level of experience when somebody's working at, at home as they would if they were in the office. So now it's, it's not just a matter of getting somebody connectivity, getting them access to their applications, but then trying to replicate as best we can some of the security that we had when users were accessing things from on-prem, things like accessing a uh, secure SSID or logging, logging into a wireless access point or some network access controls, things like that all go away when users are working at home. So we have a, we feel that there's a better way forward. And so without further ado, the trends that we see shaping organizations today are the big three, right? We've been talking about these for years, cloud adoption, mobility, and digital transformation. These are in a way, organic shifts, meaning that they've been a product of just evolution, evolution in technology, evolution in the way the business behaves, evolution in the way people work, right? So from productivity perspectives, um, for talent acquisition perspectives, from just growing the business and becoming more agile. So these things are shifts, right? And, and they have been primarily organic until I would say about a year ago, right? With the onset of COVID-19, you know, things like mobility obviously shot forward dramatically to where we had what was roughly an 80-20 perspective when it came to users working in the office to around 20% that were mobile or had mobile access. That flipped around completely where it was more like 80% of people were working from home or remotely, 20% in the branch, if that. And that was usually reserved to things like retail or manufacturing where people had to be on-prem. Um, so so really what we... we had to solve for that's been a little bit different this time around is the whole idea of not just providing, like I said before, basic connectivity to get users to something for a period of time, a day or so. I have to work from home today or I have a doctor's appointment, so I'm going to work from home the rest of the day. Email and a couple applications, probably all you needed. With so many people working from home full time, we had to make sure that they could get access to everything that they need to do their jobs properly, right? Keeping them productive. So things like collaboration tools and other applications all became mobile necessary. And this is where the sacrifices started to come into play. So before I get there, let's talk a little bit about the security. Current solutions that organizations are looking at as far as uh, solving this problem. Most of them are cloud delivered at this point, right? But what we wind up seeing a lot of issues is the limited coverage of applications available, right? Whether that's through the SaaS or the CASB security capability and, and how many applications are defined or uh, how many applications can be inspected for embedded threats or data loss to just the completeness of security, you know, and, and making sure that we do have that coverage everywhere we need it, that if a user is on-prem and they're they're behind certain types of security capabilities, that those, those security capabilities essentially follow them everywhere they go, right? So you can have the full security stack as a practitioner in your organization everywhere you need it to be. The reality is that's not the case. A lot of them have very limited inspection if they're inspecting at all. When it comes to you know internet security capabilities, we're talking typically around web proxies, right? And web proxies have a known limitation as far as what type of traffic they can inspect. When we talk about remote access through software-defined perimeter, most of them, if any, inspect traffic at all, right? They're more of a broker of a, of a secure connection rather than actual actually providing security in line. And then it's the user experience that comes with that, right? When, you, when you're going on-prem to off-prem or you're mixing solutions that you need to provide access to certain applications or functions, the consistency isn't there, right? Because you, you may be using a proxy for certain applications when on-prem or, or at home, but then you may be going through a VPN or a software-defined perimeter to get to applications on-prem whether and whether or not there is the right level of security or what that policy looks like. It can all vary, right? So what we're trying to do is see how we can best eliminate and streamline these concerns from most customers. 
So what we're trying to tackle as well is the idea of exposed services, right? When we think about what can be accessed by users either internally, externally, or let's even consider a bad actor, right? The reality is the in internal threat or the insider threat is just as bad or just as big of a risk as an external threat. So who can access what and when? How can we make sure that the policies around what we're get providing access to are not only based in identity, but also adaptive? And adaptive could mean a lot of things. That could mean, okay, Jason, right, at Palo Alto Networks has his laptop with a remote access client. I have full access to all of the applications I'm supposed to have. When Jason, me, tries to access the same set of applications from my phone or my BYO tablet, I have a subset of applications, maybe those that are, you know, a little less critical. And maybe of those applications, I even have different levels of access. Maybe I can only read an application rather than upload or download. Things need to be adaptive, but consistent, making sure that regardless of how I'm accessing something, that the security is there, that the same security protections there, but then whatever extra security precautions are needed in order to keep data safe are available. And then scale, let's, let's face it, you know, when we talk about remote access and things like that, the biggest thing everybody started dealing with about 12 months ago was scalability issues, right? The ability to make sure that I could get all of my users working when they needed to work, period. And so what that caused was the situation of increasing VPN capacity, right? Or doing something along those lines of how do I augment what I'm doing to make sure I have capacity? For those that couldn't find a solution fast enough, or for those that couldn't increase capacity fast enough, those are where, where the security compromises came into place, right? So we had to provide good access to SaaS services or cloud services or wherever, um, but we couldn't congest our VPN head ends, let's just say. And so what, what we did was split traffic off, right? We wound up having some traffic go direct, others going to the data center for security inspection, but everything that went direct was a new risk, right? Because now we're not looking at that in line. We just feel that there's probably a better way to deal with this. Overall, when we talk about traditional VPNs and remote access, what we're looking at is how the user is accessing something and what, what steps they're going through to access it. What are the potential points of risk? And I'm not even talking just security risk, but performance risk, right? But there's everything from the performance itself to security consistency, to what happens when that user is accessing an application, right? What do they have access to given that type of remote access solution? Thinking about traditional VPNs, which are really just network connectors, right? You've got a user with an IP address connecting to a VPN concentrator, which is another IP address. So you're ne network to network with no inherent security built in. So then what happens is you have access to everything that that VPN domain has access to, which is usually some type of large aggregation pool, and then users are distributed throughout other systems. And hopefully there's some type of filtering going on, whether it's content inspection, whether it's just ACLs directing users to certain networks that they have access to, whatever that may be. The, the reality is though, by default, that is not the case. By default, users have access to everything that is attached to that LAN segment that their VPN concentrator is attached to. So how do we make that better, right? How do we provide a more surgical approach to application access from a user perspective? When it comes to then, okay, now we're, we've, we've attached, right? We've used our VPN to attach into this somewhat porous data center LAN that, that the VPN is attached to, but now our users have to access something like a SaaS. Now you've got limited inspection ability, most likely, right? Because you're, you're doing this from on-prem to off um, and trying to, to trying to do that not only in a way that um, is, is secure, which we don't have a lot of, but what's that scalability look like where I was talking about before having to split traffic off in that v split VPN perspective. Um, it, and then the cloud services themselves, right? Making sure that when a user attaches into a VPN that then has a connection off to the cloud VPC, that it's not just an open tunnel for anybody that's connecting in to just have access. This is called trusted access, right? This is what we're all trying to get away from in the spirit of zero trust. Zero trust is that idea of there's no inherent or implicit access from a user to a resource just by attaching to a service. So this is where we have to make the change, but we wanna make it while honoring the best possible user experience we can deliver. So with Prisma Access, Palo Alto Network's uh, remote access solution, 
Uh, this is how we're approaching it, right? This is where we say the user, regardless of how they're coming in, we have several options. We have the Global Protect client, which is our agent that runs on the endpoint. We also have a clientless option available, which is more browser-based for browser-based applications. But our integration with Okta is seamless, right? So when your user is logging into their Okta web top and their SSO, and they're clicking on a tile for an application that they have access to based on policy, Prisma Access is going to broker that session and inspect it in line for threats and data loss. This is a, a much different approach than what several others are taking. And it doesn't matter where that application resides. This is the beauty of it. Whether it's the data center, cloud, SaaS, or web, it can look across all of it, right? So it, a lot of organizations out there that are, that are playing in the secure remote access or secure access service edge or SASE space wind up dividing their access solutions into two products, right? They've got their private access product, which is for secure access to data center and cloud apps. And then they've got their secure gateway product, which is their, their web proxy and CASB functionality. Two different products, hard to integrate all of that together in a seamless fashion. Prisma Access is a unified approach. So it's able to provide secure access no matter where the user is, at home, on the go, or even in the branch, to these resources no matter where they are, data center, cloud, SaaS, or web, with that full integration with Okta. So whatever conditions are applied to that user and how they're accessing their web top, that conditional access is applied and enforced through Prisma Access. This is how we chalk it up, right? When we look at how the layers of this all come together, you've got your users and how things are being accessed along the bottom. You've got your resources at the top, single cloud-based platform delivering the security. So Prisma Access is taking the approach of a security as a service layer, which includes firewalling as a service, CASB, so that's full spectrum CASB, both inline inspection and out of band with APIs. Zero Trust Network Access being the foundation of everything we do, which I'll talk about here shortly. And then Cloud Delivered Secure Web Gateway. So taking those things like SSL decryption, IDS IPS, DLP, sandboxing for malware and zero day threats, and combining all of that into a single solution. While also now, from our perspective, being able to provide end-to-end -end visibility of the traffic flows and streams from the user to the destination. We're doing that through our autonomous digital experience management. That's giving us segment-wise insights. So user to their broadband modem, broadband modem to their ISP, ISP through the security cloud, security cloud to the destination. All with the ability to carve that up, drill into each one of those segments to see where problems might be happening, performance issues are being encountered so that we can remediate. A lot of that can be driven in an automated way, right? As far as taking a look at something and seeing, oh, wow, something's out of threshold or out of band from what we expect. How do we go about solving that problem? With the full integration with Okta, right? Making sure that we have the adaptive multi-factor authentication. So again, we'll use me as an example. I'm at home right now with my GP client. This is where everybody's kind of working at Palo Alto Networks. I have full access to my applications, single factor authentication. If I take my laptop to some hotspot right now and try to access the same set of applications, you know what? My network is not re recognized. I'm going to be asked for an additional factor, right? So we can do conditional MFA based on things like that, right? What, what IP address am I coming from? Is it considered a known IP address because I've already been coming from it for the last year? Or is this a brand new IP address that hasn't been recognized before? We should probably add another layer of security to that. So we can make it fully adaptive while enforcing the SSO uh, policy all in line. Here's how it looks, right? When we talk about the integration, which I already mentioned and showed on a previous slide, from the BYO perspective, we have a nice way around this, right? We have full integration between Okta and Prisma Access for SSO, multi-factor authentication, regardless of what the user is trying to access. It doesn't matter if it's SaaS, a cloud resource, or even a non-prem resource. Private applications, public facing applications can all be treated and inspected and enforced through Prisma Access, single cloud, single capability. So this allows a very clean approach, I will say, to providing this not only access, but how it's being secured. When it comes to BYO or an unmanaged device, you know, so even apply this to a contractor user or a third party or something like that, where we don't have the ability to manage that endpoint. One of the things that I'll talk about here coming, coming up is 
the ability to inspect this traffic for threats and data loss, right? This is, again, what I mentioned before around VPNs traditionally not having a you know, security built into them. They're more of a secure connectivity provider. Software-defined perimeters are much the same and that they are taking another step by having identity-based access and doing some policy checks against a device or the user context. But once those policy checks are done, it's providing an encrypted tunnel between the endpoint and that destination with no security inspection in line. That can be a big risk because when we talk about then your layers of defense, if that end, end user device or the user themselves becomes compromised, credential theft, IP address spoofing, connectivity spoofing, what is your next layer of defense if you don't have inline inspection? There really isn't one, right? And so now we're relying on host or application-based security alone to keep that that data and that resource safe. And you know, the reality is sometimes that's not enough, right? Because usually by the time malicious traffic hits its target or its destination, it's too late. That's why we have defenses that we do. So now let's take a look at the same scenario with managed devices, right? We can now do a full host information profile report. So same connectivity, same principles apply, same integration with Okta. Now we're going to do a, a step further in terms of what we would consider our zero trust approach, our zero trust network access approach. A host information profile is just as it sounds. It's a way to gather information about the user and the host in real time to ensure that that user as presented is who they say they are, or at least as close as we can get, right, to make sure that they are. And when, when you were talking about dozens of checks that we can make against the endpoint and the user, to try to validate and ensure that they are who they say they are and that the context is valid. It provides us a much better footing to get started when it comes to zero trust network access. But then from there, now it's about the application. What are they trying to access? Do they have the ability to do so? And if they do, fantastic, but we're still not gonna necessarily trust it from there. We're going to, like I said before, continue the zero trust approach by inspecting that traffic, that, that private application or session traffic for embedded threats or data loss. That is taking a more literal approach to zero trust. It doesn't trust the user before, so no implicit or inherent access before connecting to the service or during, but then zero trust after. After those HIP checks are validated and everything else, we're still gonna make sure that nothing bad is happening within the session. This is what sets Prisma Access and Okta apart from Okta and most other solutions. This all falls into our CTA, our continuous trust assessment, right? And that winds up starting with understanding that device, like I talked about, making sure that the context is there, the location is there, trying to do the best we can to make sure that things like the source IP address isn't being spoofed and things like that. Then the user, making sure that the user is who they say they are. What is their authentication you know, profile? Is it cert-based or if it's, you know, purely, um, you know, log into a, to a screen um, and, and how often that interval should be, you know, if, if that's a, day, a daily cert expiry or 30 day cert, whatever that is, is the context there? Is it right? Are we still valid? And then let's make sure we're continuously monitoring, inspecting, and making sure that if something does change from either of those profiles, both the device or the user, that we can en enact a response, right? Maybe kick the user out, force them to reauthenticate, or kick them out, now MFA is applied. You know, different things to make sure that there, we're always taking a most secure approach to what's being accessed. So here's how we, we set it up, right? I talked a little bit about how we inspect in line. This is where we differentiate ourselves from what a lot of others do. So same scenario, users coming in, whether they're clientless or with the, or with the Global Protect application that runs on the endpoint, they connect to the Prism Access Security Cloud via IPsec tunnel or the browser-based SSH ses session, user ID is immediately challenged. This is that whole idea I was talking about, user context, device information, all of those things. This is the first part of the policy. So before anything is done, we're validating who the user is and their device. There's no implicit or inherent access to anything. It's a default deny policy. From there, app ID, right? Making sure that th what that user has access to is valid, right? They're trying to access an application. By policy, they should have access to it. This is where the conditioning comes into play though as well. If I'm coming in on the laptop with the GP client, full access to all of my applications as granted by policy. I have my phone also simultaneously or instead of trying to access applications because it's my BYO phone. I don't have access to all the same applications. 
or those that I do, it's a subset of, of levels, right? Of levels of access. So all of that is conditional and adaptive based on what's happening and what's being identified. These first two steps of the process. Now, this is where pretty much everybody that's doing remote access today is stopping, right? So everybody's doing the posture checks and making sure that the device context and user is good, that they're only accessing the application specified by policy. So a more layer seven based approach based on identity. But where we take that one step further, this is the inspection that I'm talking about, content ID. This is where what we do and nobody else is doing right now when it comes to remote access to private applications, right? It, this is the ability to be the inspection, you know, engine of the traffic itself, making sure that it's free of threats, uh, free of zero day uh, threats as well. DLP is applied, that policy, looking at that data, making sure if this is internet or web bound traffic, this is where we apply URL filtering and DNS security, not just looking at the DNS string. It's making sure if there's a DNS tunneling app, something like Iodine or DNS cap, that we're identifying it and, and making sure that there's there, we're blocking it, or if it's allowed for some reason, that we are inspecting it for threats. So full content inspection. And so all stitched together by our policy engine, no matter where the user goes. So again, this is what's setting us apart from everybody else. So it doesn't matter whether the user's going to the to public apps like on the on the SaaS or, or web or private apps in the data center or cloud, we're applying the same zero trust single pass inspection capability across the board, making sure that data is as clean as possible, no matter where the user is. So now let's get into user experience a little bit. I, I, I think I covered off security pretty well. That's only one part of it, right? The other whole part that we're talking about is not having a compromise when it comes to user experience as well. So just a couple of stats because everybody seems to like them, but the reality is this is a CIO imperative these days, right? Making sure good user experience exists is important, right? It's important for everybody because that's, that's an indicator of productivity. If users can't work, they're not productive. Things aren't getting done then, right? Whether that's development, whether that's getting products and services out to end consumers, whatever's going on, we have to make sure our users can work and work as effectively as possible. We cannot let technology be the reason somebody doesn't work for an entire day. Those, those day long outages that we talked about or where VPN was down, but it didn't really matter because there were a couple of users, you know, here or there, and it really didn't matter that much. No longer the case when so much of our workforce is reliant on this infrastructure to provide reliable yet secure infrastructure. So working from home, right? This is something we've all identified for a while as far as all the risks that came with it, right? And, and risks, again, not just security, but just usability, right? Just being able to work. And the idea of, you know, me working from home right now and, and doing this presentation, right? There are certain things that I have to be concerned about. Is my Wi-Fi connection stable? Is, am I somewhat free of interruption and things like that? How am I able to work and work successfully and productively? we are dealing with consumer grade technology, right? What, what was delivered to our house by Hotwire or Xfinity or Time Warner or whatever was meant for consumer based usage, not necessarily for full time at home users. And so with that, we sometimes have good experiences, sometimes bad, sometimes, you know, your, your Wi-Fi router at home fails or something's going, you know, wonky with it, or somebody's trying to use your SSID from a house next door. You know, a lot, a lot of things can happen to our environment that we just have to make sure we're mitigating as much as we can. We have to make sure that the idea of getting users to their destination as quickly as possible is important because when we do think about accessing even a SaaS app at home these days, the contention with gaming, streaming services, I mean, think about it. During certain times of the day, especially when this first kicked off, every, all the kids were at home trying to do distance learning or if they weren't distance learning at that time, streaming something, spouses working at the same time, there are parts of the day that things just slow down. So is there a way to mitigate that? Is there a way to maybe eliminate that middle mile between the at-home user and their SaaS or cloud destination by speeding that up somewhere, right? So these are things we have to look at as well. The real-time collaboration tools. We're a social people, right, at the end of the day. And before all this lockdown happened, we all went in the office, sat around tables and collaborated, right? We worked together on things, solved problems, things like that. Now, Zoom was really, or WebEx or whatever Teams, you know, whatever your video conferencing uh, tool of choice was, was there to bring the other people that couldn't be there in to the discussion, but it wasn't necessarily the discussion platform. It is now. 
right? And so it's just kind of changed how we do things and how we have to look at things and what kind of throughput and capacity we need to allow these things to work and interoperate with our users seamlessly and securely. And then look, the help desk itself, right? The help desk has all kinds of challenges because they're the ones dealing with this. So are there ways to make sure that when we're talking about experience, we can, we can isolate what's going on? Do we have the way to isolate the domain of the problem? And then further understand what the conditions are of the problem. So then we can remediate, potentially even before the help desk starts getting calls. That's what we're trying to do. That's where we're trying to go. So when we start getting into this, right, we start digging into how we're trying to solve these problems, right? Our applications, um, how are they performing, right? Do we have the, the ability to access all of our applications? And if so, what does that performance threshold look like? Is it acceptable? Is it not? Um, what are we trying to do to improve that, if anything, right? What does the network path look like? Making sure that we don't have extra hops going in where there's congestion at play or where, you know, some type of weird routing condition is sending traffic around the world to get to, you know, certain app like SaaS applications, which can happen from time to time. Uh, what is, what does the behavior look like? Is it different from the branch perspective and the remote user perspective? Why is that then a condition of the application itself? or something conditional around the region that that application's hosted in versus it may be a, a user at home problem versus the branch network problem. Um, how are all these things performing, right, when it comes down to it? So this is where digital experience management is, is an improvement, right? This is where we can start to, like I said before, look at things end to end, provide segment wise insights, um, but do it in an autonomous way. And what does that mean? We, we can allow this thing to work and operate on its own. Right? We don't necessarily need human interaction with everything that we do. Is there a response that we want to be able to generate if we start to see certain conditions? You know, so pathing is bad. Okay, can we redirect that? Can we do something? If the uh, user, if it's identified that the user's home Wi-Fi router is, is down or flaky, can we proactively send them a text or an email to say, we're we are seeing issues with your broadband modem and it's you seem to be one of the only ones because everybody else coming from your general area seems okay. You might want to call your ISP provider or broadband provider. So how can we get better at doing this in a more autonomous way digitally? So making sure that that, that experience that we, we need our users to expect when they're home is there and valid all of the time. So when we, when we set out to figure out how to create this, you know, this ability to monitor and manage experience, it was based on, you know, what did, what did customers of ours or potential customers of ours give up when they started moving services to the cloud and users started move, moving from branches to at home? Well, they gave up things like being able to log into a local area network that had some monitoring. They gave up the ability to access resources across across a wide area network that probably had some monitoring built into it too for link availability, uptime, throughput, uh, saturation, and latency. And then with, within the data center, we had taps, right? NetFlow taps or something like that that could do application performance management from the network perspective, making sure that the network was clear of any obstruction for that particular user. Well, let's see if we can replicate that to the cloud, right? Making sure that if as now the users are remote and services are moving out to cloud internet and, and SaaS services, how do we get in that visibility back? So how do we make sure that end-to-end -end visibility can be achieved? So this is how we do it. We do it also with, through synthetic synthetic uh, taps, right, and probes, making sure that we can we can look at things in a per segment way. This is where we get to isolate that trouble domain, right? So is it between the user and their Wi-Fi router, like I said, or the Wi-Fi router and the ISP, the ISP and the security cloud, the security cloud and their destination, right? So by probing these things every so often, we can determine where the problem exists to quickly isolate it. Is it a single user, single application, group of users, entire region, very quickly. We can do this with a dashboard that, that shows what these applications should look like based on a benchmark that we have set. And now things are out of spec, right? And so now we can start drilling in and addressing those. So thank you. Thank you for your time. I hope this showed you how Prisma Access with Okta can both enable a secure and good user performance experience for our users now that they're working at home. It takes a lot of the risk out of the equation. We're making sure that we're providing the best possible experience without sacrificing security. Thank you.